He was a robot, and he could do everything a man could do. Yes, everything. (laughs) Today on Dumpster Book Club, we're talking about The Silver Metal Lover by Tanith Lee. I'm Sean. I'm Mimi. And I'm Bob. (laughs) Uh, Today, for Valentine's Day, we have a special guest, Bob, because every romantic evening needs a third wheel. I'm here. I love robots, so... (laughs) And this book is kind of like Chobits, but it's a younger girl with an older man robot. Really? I thought it was like a Black Mirror episode written by a 13-year-old pretending to be 16. (laughs) But also more romantic. I've never seen it. I've only seen anime for 12-year-old girls. Okay, well, maybe it's the same. <laughs> Black Mirror and Chobits. <sighs> covers? Yeah, do you guys want to talk about these crazy covers? Uh, there were a lot of them, because I guess this... I don't know why this book has so many variations on the cover, but there are a lot. It's a way more popular book than we usually read. There's, like, a lot of reprints. Uh, Sean and I read the science fiction book club selection version. I think this it's the cover. best cover. Yeah, <laughs> so it's they're pretty all pretty hideous. <laughs> all the covers are pretty ridiculous, but this, like, the one Sean has from, what is it, 1982, it might be the first one, it kind of looks like Lord Zed from Power Rangers, that meaty <laughs> guy with all the metal on him. Like, he has that texture, even though the silver metal lover isn't made of meat. <laughs> yeah, and just the horrible details of his fingers all his digits have so many knuckles and the detail in his face and his neck there's like he has very accentuated dimples he's got like abs on his face (laughs) he has neck abs and face abs but then his lips are like pouty pink (laughs) contrast against his like cool silver blue skin (laughs) and his like bright red wig yeah his hair like grass and then just you know on this like poop splatter background that he's coming out of <laughs> it's pretty weird um the one i read is the 1999 cover and it's i think the most recent one unless you count the ebook version and it's just like a romantic drawing of a robot man with a little shimmery you know cyborg eye i'm not really sure he's playing a guitar with like beautiful leaves painted on it he looks like a Dungeons and Dragons bard. Oh yeah, he does. But made of metal. Also, our main character is like hiding in the back of this cover oh. against the sunset. Like just kind of in the distance. <laughs> Even though she's like the one who's narrating the whole book and it's about her life. Well, that's all romances, right? Oh, it's it's from the perspective of a, a lady but has the hunk on the cover. Oh, that's true. Well, unless there's a horse on the cover. <laughs> that's the other thing you can have. Oh. Uh, um, so what are these other covers you sent us? Uh, so there was a comic that was done just a few years later that's an adaptation of this book. Like, they just copy-pasted lines out of it. It's like the Cliff Notes version. And all the art is, like, airbrushed. And it looks really Mm. weird. I think if I had read this book this way, I would have really hated it a lot. But I got it on eBay, and it's the first edition print. And there's a Kickstarter to reprint it that just kicked this January. And they're going to like release like a new alternate cover. They reached their goal of $15,000. There's a lot of people interested in this getting reprinted. (laughs) Oh my gosh, there's nips. Oh yeah, that's the page I highlighted. It's like this weird image of them in bed and then like a... Wow, I do not want to imagine all these characters looking like this. Me neither. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Like, I'd be really upset if I imagined them this way. It all looks kind of like, it's like Archie, but really bad. <laughs> oh, jeez. Yeah. yeah, some of the characters, I really did not imagine looking anything like that. That's and not then... how she even describes them. <laughs> I did try to get this on the Kindle, but the Kindle version is only available in the UK, apparently. Um... But that cover was amazing. It's got what? Which one is that? It looks like it's definitely from the year 2000. It's like two (laughs) 
CG people Whoa. who are bald <laughs> and like just ro- shiny silver everywhere, and they're like looking into each other's silver robot eyes. It's like an early two thousands music video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of weird because at no point do either of them become bald. That's true. The other one is a. Uh, from 1986 and you can kind of tell that it was in the 80s because it just looks like David Bowie is like painted silver and strumming a guitar in like some kind of gnome chess land. Man, but look at look at the city in the background. It looks like a bunch of butt plugs. (laughs) That's true. Every building is a butt plug. Some look religious because they have spires. It also looks like He's either underwater or there's a lot of fungus. This is a really weird drawing. And then there's a Japanese one that looks like a sick manga. Yeah, Japanese books actually just have better covers overall. But his hair is just like a cloud. (laughs) And she's coming out of a vagina. Yeah, that's part of his cloak. (laughs) Yeah, like I said, awesome book cover. (laughs) Yeah, it's like a metaphor. She's like being reborn, right? (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) From her male robot lover. Um, and then there's this one that I am not sure when it came from. It kind of looks like the David Bowie one. Gosh. It's really ugly. I don't know how I feel about it. This is the worst one. (laughs) It looks like someone kind of tried to Photoshop some pictures to make it look sci-fi, but really failed. He's like a horrible little gnome. And are they, like, sitting on something? Like, how are her legs, like, bent I can't tell if they're sitting or walking down the stairs. (laughs) Well, like one of those races where your legs are tied together with someone else. Did you do any research about Tanith Lee, Mimi? Uh, I did, and then I forgot all of it. She has a ton of books. Yeah, there's 90 novels and over 300 short stories. I think mostly sci-fi. But she also writes fantasy and horror, like weird fiction stuff. Uh, What's that guy's name? She has something in common with Philip K. Dick. No, Stephen King. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, Robert Silverberg. They they oh. both written lesbian erotica under great a pseudonym. <laughs> I think I wanted to say about this book is so popular. It has one of those GIF reviews on Goodreads. Oh yeah, I didn't even know you could do that until I saw that. What? That's that's sort of my rating of how popular a book is. If someone has given a review of it that has GIFs from Parks and Rec or <laughs> The Office and stuff in it, yeah, I would definitely read her other work. Though. I would read more of her stuff. I think based on this book, I'm more interested in her straightforward sci-fi or horror or something because those were the parts i liked of this book Mm. rather than the romance elements but how does this book start talk about our main character (sighs) jane the beginning of the book is the part i remember the least about well i can i can start (laughs) yeah um but we just need to talk about uh the main character jane who is the person who's writing this book for us to read um is a very, very wealthy 18-year-old? 16. 16-year-old? <laughs> it's like a plot point that she's not 18. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, 16-year-old who lives in a giant house on suspension stuff, like way up in the clouds with her mom that overlooks what is basically a dystopian future. Uh, we live in a world where an asteroid has gotten caught in Earth's uh, gravitational pull and causes a bunch of earthquakes and tidal problems. Killed like a third of Earth's population. Yeah, and in the aftermath, capitalism has sort of run amok uh, where uh, you have to pay for something called a polycode, which is what allows you to call the police. And there you have to pay on the spot for medical care there's that guy that gets stabbed and has to like (laughs) pay to get it fixed was that just because he didn't have insurance though uh, they didn't insurance was not mentioned i think you just there were a lot of things that also made this dystopian future feel like a little bit too real she wrote this in what 1981 but there's so much stuff where it's like she just uses her video phone to call a self-driving uber and 
There's like <laughs> she checks out at like Amazon Go and you know you just walk out with stuff. Everything mm-hmm. is like self service kiosks, but then businesses that cater to the wealthy will actually employ real people and that's like a selling point that they don't just have robots and ai things serving you yeah Uh, a big a big point of the book is uh automation has started taking over and people are struggling to find work they um yeah also touch on like how intense the class and like income disparity is to the part it's like if you're certified rich you can't get a job like you gotta (laughs) save it for the poor people which kind of also highlights another like weird idea in capitalism that's like you i don't know that you have to work or something i don't know it was weird <laughs> and too real yeah i i liked it because it was like it was just from the perspective of someone who doesn't have to struggle with the dystopian future looking down on it and she kind of just sort of accepts things and isn't really bothered by a lot of them at first yeah uh, it was it was cool i liked it <laughs> one of the reasons i'm really interested to read some of tanith lee's other stuff is that I imagine it's not all written like this because the character Jane had a really strong character voice, I guess. like She wrote the book. Yeah, but it really felt like you were reading something written by like a really wealthy 16-year-old mm-hmm. kid. Who's having a lot of like emotional problems. <laughs> yeah. yeah, she's got emotional problems, but like she really lives in this world. And it's not just like, I don't know, like the Robert Silverberg stuff. Like, it didn't matter who the character was or what world they lived in. They all felt like they were written by the same guy. No, it's it's very cleverly done, I think. So she's she's always talking about kind of her rich 16-year-old problems, but there's, like, enough detail that you can kind of see through that to the background dystopia going on where the guy who gets stabbed, and she just watches that. It's like, she's talking about how traumatic it was for her and how she had to go through like hypnotherapy to like get over seeing this horrible thing. But like, that's like someone's life. (laughs) They just got stabbed (laughs) and they're trying to use like an ATM machine or something. Um, yeah, I guess I didn't think about how clever it was that through this like pretty like initially whiny coverage of her story. She's also told us so much about that world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Should we talk more about Jane? Yeah, I think this also illustrates what Jane was like, the fact that we just talked about something (laughs) else. (laughs) Yeah, so Jane is super wealthy. They're living in the perfect future if you're super wealthy. So her mom, Demita? I don't know. Uh, I think Demita is how you say it. Yeah, Demita, like, had her made with, like, some guy's sperm, and then she, like, you know, had Jane. But it's, like... (laughs) They're in the future, so it's like they can control every aspect of people. So it's like, oh, based on Jane's bone structure, she takes these pills so that she can be a Venus media or something, mm-hmm. which is like a plumper person because her bone structure should mean that that complements her better. And she like does something to like molecularly dye her hair because that complements her skin the best. And like, <laughs> well, yeah. uh, I mean, jumping ahead a little bit, Demita her mom basically made Jane to be an accept, uh, like an accessory, like a very fancy handbag or something. She just wanted a daughter to have a daughter and she had to be perfect in all these ways and stuff. Yeah. She's, should we talk about Demita? I guess. Well, she's should like, we talk about Jane more <laughs> we, first? We could talk about Demita, well, uh, circle back to okay. Jane. I mean, Demita like definitely like created Jane and like caused her to be like this. <laughs> Just, yeah she's like very controlling mother but every aspect well, of her that, life is in control it's that kind of story where it seems like demita has jane's best interests but really it's all just psychological abuse and trying to force her to be certain ways to make demita look good i think that's the part that kind of was convincing initially about it being written from like you know a teen's point of view because mm-hmm. it's like it's that stage where you're like questioning, like, okay, my mom wants me to do all these things, and they're for the best, but it's like none of them are the things I want to do. Yeah. And like, so it's it, that is true. It's it's not necessarily clear if Demita is so evil or if it's you know Jane's perspective of her. There's definitely some like family counseling that can happen though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they need some help. Okay. There's also. Yeah, Demita is always like, Jane's got to take her vitamins, all this stuff. There's a part, I hope you're masturbating regularly, <laughs> like I suggested. And like, 
just because that's what you need to do to be a healthy person. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, I sort of uh, interpreted that as a more world building instead of their weird relationship. It's like a more sexually open world where people just masturbate and everybody knows about it. Oh, maybe it's both, you know? It could be, yeah. Yeah, it's a pretty sexual world. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What else? What else about uh, Jane? I mean, she starts off very, like, in her... I mean, she's always in her head, but, like, way more bland, I guess. She's just telling us about her life, but from the perspective of, like, the other people in her life and what they want her to be and, like, how she fits in with them. She's sort of neurotic and cries a lot doesn't have a a vision of herself really there's a part where she talks about how she's heavily influenced by other people's emotions uh to the point where when she's on a video call with her friend egyptia egyptia starts crying and then jane starts crying (laughs) just because egyptia's crying and she suggests that's not even a irregular occurrence (laughs) <laughs> just two people crying at each other over the phone just skype each other and weep at each other should we talk about our other friends uh, yeah we talk about clovis, clovis. <laughs> okay clovis wow i like that he's mirror biased <laughs> um so mirror biased is uh their future word for gay no it's not even gay is it, it not it's gay but it's the next level where your partner has to look like you it, it, clovis <laughs> isn't like looking just for a man he's looking for a man that has the same like physical characteristics as him <laughs> yeah. i thought i thought mirror biased was just gay because like you're into the same gender but then like jane says that he's extra mirror biased but i could be wrong it seems like a lot of people are mirror biased, though. I couldn't recall if she said extra or not. I thought she was saying... Well, some of she says some of his other lovers are mirror biased also. Yeah. But they could also be into themselves. I guess that's why I thought there was, like, mirror biased was different from being gay. Because his other lovers also like men. They could, I don't know. Like, he could date someone who looks like him, but doesn't yeah. have to... Yeah. Maybe. Does, do, do they say Jane... Is there one part where he says Jane could be mirror biased? No, or... they just always talk about how Jane would make a hot boy. Okay. Oh, yeah. Like, Clovis is basically kind of hitting on her all the time, but would never do it because she's, you know, a lady and not <laughs> doesn't look like him. And he, he's also, okay, he's also just a, like, prankster, a jokester, kind of. Past that to cruel, I think. But yeah, he'll, like tell his boyfriends that jane is a boy in drag and stuff and just like just tell people lies Mm -hmm. just constantly some of the meaner pranks he did was specifically so that what to break up with somebody break up with them but he also doesn't like to be touched he has that that weird uh conundrum where he's very sexual but he also like abhors being touched or touching people or physical closeness. I guess he also had like commitment problems and <laughs> certainly <laughs> might be tough if you're only dating people that look like you. <laughs> like a good one. <laughs> uh, but he's also out of all of Jane's friends that she lists off, her best friend, the closest, the closest to a real friend. Yeah, yeah. He's Maybe like, real friends. Yeah. I don't know. It's, he, he seems so mean to me. It's like, oh, I couldn't be friends with this guy. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's weird. It's like he keeps doing those things later that are like, why are you guys friends? <laughs> I don't understand, but you're really helping out. I guess it's just different when you're so wealthy, you can't really have problems. I mean, he was certainly a better friend than Egyptia. Oh, my God. <laughs> She is 18, I think, or she's, yes. like, several years older. She's 18. Um, and she's just so into herself, like... She's an egomaniac, <laughs> even but though, actually... Even though Jane is pretty, like, self-centered, especially at the beginning, it's, like, nothing compared to Egyptia. Yeah, Egyptia's, like, not just self-centered, she's, like, yeah, ego-tripping. She's, like, in a delusional state <laughs> constantly, where she is the only person that exists. <laughs> it's like she comes out of herself... And sees Jane sometimes like Jane, you're here, you're beautiful, <laughs> and then she like goes back in herself like, no, actually, I'm beautiful. <laughs> That's like most of Egyptia. And um, her big thing is she's very afraid that she'll die before other people can realize how great she is. She's always afraid there's going to be another earthquake, 
or a flood or something. Uh, and she's intensely wealthy. Like, Jane's very wealthy, but has, like, a kind of a mother controlling that wealth and, like, her behavior. But they talk about how, like, Clovis has parents, but they just let him have, like, as much money as he wants. And, like, Jane has, like, a thousand dollar, what do they call them, MUs, some kind of credits. Yeah, yeah. some kind of, like, credit. She has a monthly allowance of a thousand somethings. Yeah, which is probably a lot. And then, like, Clovis just can use as much as he wants. And I forget about Egyptia, but she has, like, a whole house to herself or mm-hmm. something. And For some reason, I thought... Clovis was the richest one, but um, or maybe Jane is, but she has such a small allowance. Yeah, that was the thing. It's just like she was really focusing on how much they all had access to mm. of their parents' money. So we don't totally yeah, no. know what their parents actually mm. have. Maybe That's Clovis true. just acted the most rich. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny when you mentioned Clovis being like, <laughs> I was like, or maybe like Wallace from Scott Pilgrim a little bit. Oh, yeah. 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 Only because I'm staring at your poster. <laughs> <laughs> that that too. Is that an archetype? The kind of mean, sassy gay friend? <laughs> yeah. I think so. Okay. I liked reading a lot of his parts with his, like, he always had some quip or something. Yeah, but his quips weren't, like... They were fun. <laughs> they were all right. They weren't, like, clever or really jokes. I think they were clever in the context of this universe. Like Maybe. <laughs> For yeah. the writing that existed in this book, it was all right. Okay. Jane has some other friends, Jason and Med- Medea. And Medea. Yeah. Uh, they're twins, and they're, like, tied at the hip, basically. But they're also big assholes. <laughs> they're even mean. They're actually <laughs> mean, as opposed to Clovis. It's only just mean in words. Mean-spirited versus mean, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, they were horrible. They were also twins who were born six months apart. That's the future. <laughs> But there's there's really no other than being together and having some inborn cruelty. They don't. There's nothing about them. Yeah. They don't really have any defining features in the. They're like cruel actions are what ends up defining them. They're like the two kids who bully you all the time or something. Yeah, and I don't think there's any relation to their Greek counterparts or anything other than the names. Um, but there's also that one friend she has that I forget his name. Is like, oh, he's off in the equator studying silt. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Imagine it like 10 times the book. Just, <laughs> oh, there's the silt guy, too. Yeah. Wait, wasn't that one of Clovis's ex-boyfriends? No, no, no. no the, she friend had another here. friend. The, it, it's mentioned in this comic. This comic is actually a great way to like... <laughs> recap. <laughs> recap. Yeah. David. Oh, yeah. David. I guess, I mean, I don't, I agree. It's way too many times, but it's like, it kind of ties into like how you know upper society works in this world like her mom is also like constantly doing talks and going to places like Mm -hmm. her mom respects that david is at the equator (sighs) but yeah i don't know why they bring it up so much the only person in their friend group though actually doing something with their lives like everyone else is just partying and having fun i guess egyptia has her acting career but everyone else is just being and then david is chose to go to the equator to study silt because He's passionate about it or something. <laughs> it's like going to university. Um, oh, yeah. And though Jane's, like, really only close with Clovis and likes Egyptia okay, she mentions that, like, she has these friends because her mom wants her to. Because it's, like, well-rounded for her to have these friends. Like, she literally says something about, like, she thinks Egyptia is completely crazy, but she encourages me to hang out with her. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> <sighs> I guess that's all her friends right yeah um the book begins with jane going to support egyptia as she tries out for her acting position which acting sounded really funny to me where if you want to be in a play you just pay to be in <laughs> and then you have to like keep paying for the productions and stuff i thought she didn't but that's just what happened because that's how Egyptia got in. Or oh, something, maybe. Right? Yeah, I think she was there to audition, and then people did like her because, in all of her like madness, Jane does mention a few times like there is some kind of like acting greatness in her because she can like become that person. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then she might have also gotten the part because she was rich, and then she was like treating them all. But at the same time, a company that I don't know the name of is it Electronic, electronic Metals? Okay, <laughs> something Electronics. Electronic metals. Uh, a company is showing off their new super robots, 
So these new robots are supposed to be sort of human companions, not necessarily for a specific purpose. And they're very expensive and they're very lifelike. And there's different lines based on different metals. So the gold line are dancers. And martial artists. <laughs> yeah. Slash bodyguards. Yeah. yeah. And the silver line, which is the one that the book is about, are musicians. And I don't remember what the other one was. Copper. Copper. They were actors? Yeah, they were actors. They did like that Hamlet scene. Okay. Jane meets Silver and immediately falls in love, but is also horrified. Amy, when did you read this book? <laughs> I, he, well, you read the first three chapters like a long time ago and uh, then finished yeah, it. Yeah, really sorry. Recently. I mean, I like have, I, I think I got a little confused because she was kind of confused and <laughs> wasn't sure where, I don't know. I'm sorry. Well, it is kind of confusing because her emotions are like crying and being upset, but it is she fell in love with this robot. And she's also just a little confusing because she does things like a normal human wouldn't do. Whereas like you see some really hot, then you start crying because they're so hot. And then you like yell at them meanly. And then you have to like run home and tell your mom everything about it. Yeah, but she doesn't end up telling her mom everything about it because it's a robot man. That's like, I feel like that's the excuse for why she behaves certain ways. It's like she's looking at this sexy man, but he's a robot. He's not real. How can you be so sexy is basically what she yells at him. Like, what right do you have being this hot and this robotic? Oh, my God. Yeah. And that pretty much ruins her day. She decides she's going to spend the whole day in the bathtub. Because she's sexually confused now. Uh-huh. It'd probably be easier to be mirror biased or something. <laughs> Does she call? She calls Egyptia. And Egyptia's having a party because she got into, into the acting thing. The Actors Guild, yeah. Oh. Jane decides to go to the party. Yeah, there's this whole thing where Jane wanted to tell her mom about it and then couldn't. And her mom was in a hurry to go do something fancy. So her mom's like, just, you know put it on a tape for me and i'll watch it later like record it <laughs> record a vlog and i'll watch your vlog later and she kind of encourages her to like go out and do something so well I, that's i think that's why she calls egyptia and then at this party she meets lord oh yeah there's a guy <laughs> good old lord, lord who's who's pretty horrible he was i i mean he's like a regular man at a club that's what he was yeah like. is that what people are like at clubs yeah he seems so an, horrible uh, it's going outside's bad <laughs> <laughs> um the lord so i interpreted that as like oh this is how sexually free the world is where you can just meet like a shitty guy at a club and he's terrible but you still yeah. have sex with him because that's just normal <laughs> life right now <laughs> yeah it was a little bit <laughs> too real <laughs> okay well, she has a normal human experience where you meet a <laughs> shitty guy at a club and she considers having sex with him, but then decides humans suck. And then uh, she, like, throws up to get away, get out of it, right? Throws, she she says she's nauseous. Oh, yeah. okay. But he finds that horrifying. <laughs> like, disgusting. You might throw up. <laughs> During this whole thing, it's like, I guess he is, like, a creepy guy at a club because she's kind of like, I'm not really interested. Then he just starts following her around across this party. But, of course, she runs into silver the robot that's just so hot he's at this party egyptia's paid to have him hang out at the party and be a fun party thing yeah and i guess something that makes it less unusual that she's in love with this robot man is that like everyone kind of is they're all very enamored by him and like he's you know singing fucking green sleeves but apparently adds lyrics new lyrics to it playing on his guitar and everyone's like wow this is amazing and they're like crowding around him and like just completely enthralled. Right after that, Egyptia asks him to kiss her, and Jane is like, whoa, you could do that. You could just <laughs> tell this sexy robot to kiss you, and it will. Yeah, that was like her life-changing moment. It was like the door of sexuality was open for her. <laughs> you can just kiss a robot. Wow. And just to backtrack a little bit, that uh, party is like where they first start introducing like just start slipping in things that are part of the sci-fi future like the green wine and everyone's doing the snake dance at this party but they never say what the snake dance is just that everyone's doing it oh and they talk about the music they listen oh, yeah. to where it's just like hours and hours of rhythms or drums and stuff it's drum and bass or something yeah i thought that was cool just 
sprinkling in these like details uh, about you don't think drum and bass is really cool <laughs> <laughs> that there's future music and like future dances and it's just like normal it's kind of in there in the background but yeah it's funny though because they're always drinking caffeine or whatever and smoking cigarines yeah so she just added Eden to the end of everything <laughs> Anyway, snake dance. I was just trying to imagine what the snake dance would be like, and it was weird. Yeah, so that kind of scene goes on, and then Jane, like, goes and stalks the robot because he's leaving the party. Yeah. And then Jane gets the robot after she confronts him in her weird weird and confusing ways again and tries to ask if, you know, he remembered her and whatever. Uh, then Jane confirms, like, wait, where are you going? Like, into a warehouse or something? He's like, oh, no, Egyptia hired me for the night. And Jane's like... <gasps> Dude. Oh, no. <laughs> and then he's like, yeah, duh. <laughs> oh, and she gets to kiss him. She asks him oh. to do something. Maybe she seems interested. I forget why he kisses her, but he does. And it was a very nice kiss, a very professional kiss. And then some time passes, maybe? Maybe not. And She thinks about it a lot. Yeah, and she decides she wants a silver... So what happens is there's a bunch of riots about these robots almost right after this party. People are super sensitive to robots in general in this universe because uh, they haven't been provided for when automation takes over their jobs. Right. Uh, So any new robot they get super up in arms about. And I guess the arts is sort of the last bastion of humanity, like where humans can find work and do well and these robots impede on that so there's a big riot and this is the point at which jane decides she's gonna go there and get a silver the silver does jane end up going to like egyptia's house at some point finding out he's already left is that when she hears about how great the boning is does that happen between i don't remember when she finds out about how good Silver is in bed. Yeah, but Egyptia, like, you know, is already a very dramatic person, but is like, it was perfect, amazing, it's everything you would ever want, and it can go all night. That was, like, part of the cell for Egyptia. Let me go back to the part where she's, like, gearing up to go to meet Swanson. Swanson. Um, yeah... At the beginning, Jane was pretty horrible with, like, anytime she's interacting with, like, customer service people. Oh, she's yeah. one of, like, a rich person that bullies customer service people. She knows that, like, they're really lucky to have this job at this world where all yeah. these jobs are going away. And, like, <laughs> <laughs> but um, she has some trouble trying to purchase a robot since she's not. 18 yet and she, and doesn't, she doesn't have the money because she only gets a thousand a month they never say how much the robot is right they just say it's like way beyond a thousand a month i don't know the whole swanson thing's super awkward where he's like showing her the robots but also knows she's underage and doesn't want to sell it to her but it's also there and then gets mad when she doesn't buy one it was weird but the important part i think is when he shows her silver specifically the one she likes and he's like pulled apart on an operating table and she can see all his parts spread out. And then she, for a second decides that she doesn't want to be with a robot. Um, and she's very happy about it. Like, Oh great. It wasn't so sexy. It's just a robot. And for like a, a couple hours, she's very happy. And there's a thing in the very beginning of the book where she says how she's not a good writer, but she's going to write this anyway. And all her analogies are really bad. She specifically says, I have bad analogies. So my mom says I should not write. And all of the analogies up until this point in the book are really terrible. Uh, There's the the worst being where she tries to describe the people at the party and and says they look like slices of cake. (laughs) But it's full of these analogies like don't make any sense or just like super cheesy and bad. But... After this point, um, the analogies get better, or at least normal, and it's, like, normal for a minute, and you sort of, like, feel her relief in the writing, and then when she decides she's still in love with the robot again, they get bad, 
And then as like their love builds, it becomes like a normal human writing again. Okay, so I guess I didn't realize that they were just bad analogies because I was just sitting there like, hmm, the people at the party were like cake. What is that like? <laughs> they <Tim> sliced? <laughs> Timothy isn't like a super good writer, yeah. so it it was hard to show the the breadth of difference because it's like never like the most beautiful anything in the book. Okay. But I think that was the intention because there were some pretty comical analogies in the beginning. That and, makes me feel better. <laughs> and yeah, Demita definitely did have something to say about the analogies. I do remember that from the beginning. Oh, when she's at the factory, there's also this part where like each of the three tiers of robots types, I guess, have like three existing models. And like, yeah, she sees that sil- there's only two of the silver ones when there should be three. And the other one that shows up, there's like a dude and a lady. The dude looks exactly like Silver, but she's like, but I know it's not him. And that's mm-hmm. like how she asks about it. And it's like she feels this very like, I don't know, strong connection with him and can like see his personality or something. There's something wrong with that, the specific one. Oh, yeah, that is what Swanson says that like, oh, he's getting repaired. Like he went out, Egyptia, I guess, and <laughs> learned to be a human or something. I don't know. <laughs> She, not infested. Infected? Infected. <laughs> she infected him. With Gave humanity. him humanity. Yeah. In the form of weird sex, probably. <laughs> so, could any of you figure out how they bought silver? Yes. <laughs> I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Maybe it's just me, then. Well, Clovis used Egyptia's name but paid for it himself. Mm -hmm. So the robot is legally owned by Egyptia, but Clovis is the one who put up the money for it and then gives Jane the robot. But then Clovis wants to try out Silver, so he tells Jane, like, oh, Egyptia's demanding him back. You have to send him over here and that whole thing. But why did he have to buy it in Egyptia's name? Because she was 18 and Clovis is only 17. Oh, Okay. Yeah. I totally missed that. That's why it's a major plot point how old all of them are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. I was so confused with the the system of buying it. I had no idea like why this whole complicated thing was going on. <laughs> <laughs> um right. So then he takes the robot back. Okay, then this was a little bit confusing. Then he gets sent then Clovis actually gives him back to Egyptia, right? Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. I think he's, like, ashamed that of he what did he did. That. Okay. <laughs> Trying to cover it up by just yeah. actually doing the thing. So, yeah, Jane has, like, one day with him. The first day that Jane brings Silver back is yeah. one of my favorite parts of the book. Because it, it sort of, like, makes plain um, a lot of the internal struggles of, like, a first love that people feel when they're in, like, high school or something. Most people are able to contain themselves better than Jane is. (laughs) But, you know, uh, trying to, like, force things to be a certain way because that's how romance works, or trying to, like, make romantic moments, or all those moments where you say something dumb and you're like, why did I say that? Or say something (laughs) mean to somebody that you... Like, why would you be mean to this person? It doesn't make sense. Uh, And it sort of just lays it all out very obviously. And I thought that was pretty nice. And then also when she brings him into her room and she sort of reanalyzes all the things in her room because she knows that he's looking at it. Uh Just reminds me of like bringing, you know, the first person you like into your room and you're like, oh God, I have like a bunch of weird beanie babies or something. (laughs) (laughs) It's like ones you never even like look at or touch. Yeah. Like, Why are these out? <laughs> Mom. <laughs> so I thought it was just a, yeah. a like a, a neat like expression of something that like everyone goes through and it's pretty cool. Um I feel like it also begins fleshing out like how much autonomy Silver has too. Mm-hmm. Cause I feel like she's like trying to figure out like is he completely like a servant and like is ordering him to do things, but he's like I don't know. He's like a regular person for the most part. It's kind of like, well, you know, I can do things you ask, but you, I'm not just gonna... I don't know. He has his own way of operating. Yeah. Mainly, Jane really wants to bone. And Silver's like, you are not stable right now. This is a bad idea. Yeah. 
well, yeah, and then he, like, tunes that piano or whatever. Uh-huh. Yeah, I don't know. He just spends his time doing what he wants to do. Yeah, tune a piano, play a piano. <laughs> Which is, again, you know, back to that whole, like, first relationship thing, trying to, like, force someone into, like, your narrow view of what they should be like. And I guess it's, like, it kind of evolves through the book where it's, like, they're almost one another's first lovers, like, both of them, even though he's boning whoever buys him or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's like, you want to do a thing? I'm going to do something else. (laughs) (laughs) But anyway, yeah, Clovis takes Silver back. And as soon as he leaves, Jane goes into, like, complete panic mode where she's, like, what, she, like, breaks down and calls her mom asking for money so she can buy this him back from clovis and egyptia Mm -hmm. and then well she tells her mom she's in love right and then she says she's in love with clovis and her mom's (laughs) like what the fuck (laughs) not him (laughs) jane why are you in love with your gay friend (laughs) that part was really funny (laughs) just like like, being a parent like what (laughs) you're in love with who um then jane like brings in someone to sell every single thing she owns and she's like trying to be super adult and like makes herself up and like you know has a glass of some kind of alcoholic beverage maybe oh yeah (laughs) and like calls like the consignment store the liquidator and they talk about like how you know she looks like a harsh older woman why isn't she using rejuvenex or she's not using enough of it it's like oh maybe she can't afford it and like I think it's another time Jane sees real people, kind of, for the first mm-hmm. time. And is, like, Jane's trying to be, like, a bossy, fancy person. And is, like, I need it all liquidated tonight. And she's, like, well, I mean, I'll try. <laughs> and, like, the lady's, like, holding a thing that's kind of valuable for a long time and not picking up that, like, maybe, you know, Jane was supposed to bribe her. And, like, in the end, Jane's, like, trying to give it to her because the lady's, like, I could probably liquidate it all tonight. And the lady's, like, no, it's all right. You take it because... She- the realtor lady realizes that she's like a young girl selling all this stuff to run away with a lover. And she's like, well, you're going to need whatever this is <laughs> yeah. going to cost. It's kind of like Jane was trying to emulate Demita that yeah. whole mm-hmm. time, trying to be like in control, like boss her around. But So then Jane goes to Clovis, pays him back, goes to Egyptia and asks if she can have silver and egypt is like sure whatever he's like in a closet yeah. there she's like yeah i mean he's I not forgot that good about him. <laughs> and then she even does this thing jane does where she's like playing into egyptia's love of drama and is like egyptia you have it all your beautiful talent all your money and i've got nothing i need him <laughs> and jane's like kind of embarrassed because she's like oh, i was so convincing but it's because it's true <laughs> <laughs> but she gets him um, Egyptia's already like boning other dudes, and like the whole theater company is there, like drinking all her champagne. Then Jane has a plan to move out of her mom's house, live on her own. Yeah, they're gonna be go be poor. But her plan to run away still relies on her like using her mom's credit card uh-huh. for everything. She didn't think it through. <laughs> Yeah, relying on the credits every month. It was like a very 16-year-old plan to run away. Yeah, I liked you get it. some bologna sandwiches, yeah. burn your backpack. <laughs> yeah, they they move into like an apartment in a slum or something. and But of course, the first of the next month, her credit card is shut off yeah. completely. I, I guess enjoyed this weird part where... He's just, like, a perfect robot, so he's like, don't worry, we can DIY this place into beautifulness. They describe a little too much how to do each thing, where it's like, this is how you paint a rainbow on the ceiling, and put up nice curtains, and take existing candles, and put them in bowls. (laughs) Yeah, like, like, like get glass from, like, thrift stores and stuff, and use that to decorate, and they go around getting carpet samples, and they get enough free samples to carpet their entire floor in a mosaic. But it's also very, like, 16-year-old. I think of a 16-year-old's room with the, you know, the Christmas lights around and the different yep. colored, like, lava lamps and stuff. Christmas lights around my room. <laughs> yeah, everyone thought that was cool. No, no, I was about to do it, like, now. <laughs> <laughs> it's still cool. It's all around our house. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, this was, like, I, I can see this whole apartment being, like, 16-year-old dream apartment. Um, well... So, Jane's credit card is canceled. 
she calls up her mom finally to figure out what's going on with her credit card. And her mom's like, yeah, obviously you ran away. I'm going to cancel your card. Need you to come home. And, you know, she's pretty upset about Jane running away to, I don't know. Yeah, she doesn't know because somehow she like talks to Clovis and Clovis is like, I didn't tell her anything. She's like, where's Jane? Clovis is like, I don't know. <laughs> Part of Demita's like parameters, I'm cutting off your card, but you can come back. Like I'm going to give you enough money at the bank to like ride a cab back. So when you're ready to come back, I refurnished your room already. You can have your $1,000 limit again, but it's like so controlling. It's like you have to go to the bank and get the exact fare so you can only come to my house. And she also says she's cutting off the poly code too, which is oh, yeah. a big deal. Very scary. Yeah. Um, Jane, she's also not able to get a work permit because if she tries, they can like look her up and see, oh, you're actually a rich person and oh, you actually have access to all this money so you don't need a job. You're not allowed to work and take it away from. It's like trying to get out of jury duty. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so... She and Silver become street musicians and just collect money to pay rent. Silver's, like, drawing a crowd, doing his thing. Like, Silver's really good with, like, the crowd work, too. Like, getting people excited about stuff and trying to get more money out of them. Yeah. <laughs> Build it up until Jane is ready to sing, and then... And that's really the only plot point. I feel like there's a good 50 pages where... Just the only thing that's happening is the they're loving each other and Jane's becoming self-sufficient. Yeah, it was like kind of very different from a lot of, I guess because I'm not reading romance books, like a lot of other sci-fi I've read where it's like, you know, there's just always stuff happening and like mm -hmm. the relationships are like not so, I don't know, it felt like there's like one fourth of the book in the beginning and one fourth at the end were like plot and like sci-fi book and then the middle was just this like you know it's only like a month or three but it like feels like a year's worth <laughs> of text in the middle about them falling in love and him becoming more people like i wasn't even sure how long it was because at one point it seemed like maybe it was like years that they were living like this but it i think it was it, just months after after the one month i don't know if it's clear how long they survived without the um <laughs> but I thought it was kind of cool just like how she was also exploring the city and like meeting real people and it seems like there was a lot of people they were connected to at like places that where they would get breakfast and they'd like and they, actually yeah. have relationships I mean yeah, and Silver taught her to have a life basically yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like to stop being so neurotic and just try things and like it's okay to talk to people and like Walk make around. friends yeah. go places yeah it's okay to sing he kind of points out like all the things she's afraid of are or don't want to do are because of potentially her mother oh jane's uh she starts noticing all the things aside from like what wealth affords her like how all those things her mom was having her do changed her like her hair stops being dyed whatever red brown color it was and it's becoming blonde, and she loses a bunch of weight because she's not taking the pills to make herself a Venus media. <laughs> and other people take pills, too. They mentioned that, like, Medea, I think, was saying that she just stopped taking her pills that are supposed to make her thin. Jane, like, magically transforms into, like, an attractive person by normal or, like, current society standards, basically. Well... Not only does Jane have the benefit of having, like, the perfect body and hair and skin program for her, but she's also just naturally beautiful and has perfect hair and great skin. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of ridiculous. I felt like that part was very, like, talking about the future where you can have, like, designer kids, and it's like, but is that really the best choice? And But it's kind of frowned upon to not be doing that stuff, because I think some of her friends make fun of her for it later. Like, oh, I see you're not taking your special pills. Yeah, it just wasn't, like, the problem is the commentary of it wasn't, like, fully realized. It wasn't full-on Gattaca or anything. So it just felt kind of, like, bleh. Yeah, it felt like... A shitty daydream where it's like, I was so beautiful, and now I'm more beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> My natural beauty is more amazing than, than the other beauty I already had. Uh, I agree, that reveal was kind of goofy. 
and then they really focus on how small her waist is. They mention it, like, uh, several times. Yeah, that was I don't care gross. about what she looks like. Tell me about the, the hot robo-dick. That's what we're reading for. <laughs> that part was so abstract, because they oh. Because they start boning all the time, and like some of what I was reading, sometimes when they're like alluding to them having sex, I was like, "What is happening here?" It's it was like simultaneously way more vulgar than I thought it was going to be, but then they just shy away from all the details. Like, how can you not describe his wiener? <laughs> well, I feel was, like that was very important. Well, she He's talked just a like lot a about man. how it felt. She I did. Yes, it was all about her f- feeling the wiener, <laughs> but not, I don't know. Um, also, I think I've read or watched a lot of robot love stories, any kind of robot stories. There's always, like, that one key moment where either this proves that this robot feels real emotions or the opposite, where there's, like, the one key moment where you prove that, okay, this is actually an unfeeling monster Mm -hmm. and just a machine that is tricking me into thinking it's a person like in Chobits, there's that that story of like the robot that's breaking down but then her final act is to save that guy's life by pushing him across the street and then like short circuit there's like a guy who tells a joke and the robot laughs at it and it's like oh he's, he's more than a robot yeah and this the moment where jane is like oh he really does love me is when she gives him an orgasm. <laughs> That's like the defining moment. I felt like... I'm so good I gave this robot an orgasm. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be proud. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, that dildo loved it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was a pretty big defining moment, but I feel like there's another one where he's like... He's like worried for her. Does that happen before the orgasm, the real orgasm? No, I mean that. I mean that happened later. But yeah, that was that was kind of like. Well, there's the part where the second um, one, yeah. she made yeah. him upset. Yeah. That happened before that. And he's where she's denying. like, "You're a doo doo head," and then he's like, "I gotta go take a walk." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It is funny how it builds though, because he she insults him the first time at that theater, and he just kind of like turns off. It's like. He goes blank in the face and, like, walks away. <laughs> and it, like, evolves from him, like, yeah, mm-hmm. needing a walk, too. Well, their magical life kind of comes grinding to a halt because it turns out Electronic Metals is closing down and recalling all their robots for safety reasons. Yeah, but it's... The reason they give is that they're dangerous, but it's obviously supposed to be that the rioting got out of hand and everyone's making them call back. Like, they couldn't let robots be good at art, too, so they had to dial back their robots. Yeah, they start, like, saying, like, oh, they're dangerous and could spontaneously combust, but also they're not that human anyway, and, like, Mm -hmm. which is, like, very different from what Jane has experienced, not just with that robot, but checking out the robots. Like, everyone just thinks they're people, so they kind of have this whole propaganda thing to, like, make them look more fake and (coughs) pretend that they break down. Seemed like there was some, like, deal between electronic metals and, like, the government. Yeah. Um, which is all kind of hinted at. Even though it sucked for Jane, you know, probably for the benefit of the people that the government is stepping in and putting regulations on these <laughs> businesses on the robot making dick. robots. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just had a thought. Did we ever talk about Silver? We talked about the other characters a lot. And this is like, she's like always going on about him in this book. And I don't think we ever really described what he's like. We just talked about his wiener. Uh, Oh no. That's all he is. Um, Well, he's a robot. He's got red hair and a mysterious wiener. (laughs) He has red, was it auburn hair? And it's like grass is what she keeps calling it, which does not sound pleasant. That was at the beginning, right? That she called it like grass? Yeah. Is it not like grass later? Was that one of like her bad analogies? Do you think? Because it like... Yeah, that did seem super weird. It was like, hair should not be, like, grass. Yeah. It doesn't... I I, yeah, I just imagine really, really long <laughs> blades of grass, and I was like, oh, they got everything else so realistic. But I guess what Silver's personality is, he's usually pretty calm and collected. He makes a lot of jokes to try to lighten the mood always. Like, nice jokes, not, like, mean jokes, yeah, typically. Not, not like, like clothes. <laughs> yeah, he does, like, witty banter better. Uh, he's got hair on his chest, which I thought was really weird, and it's on this cover. <laughs> Just some grass on his chest. Yeah, it's like little <laughs> auburn oh. tufts. It's, ugh. 
I don't know. Whoa. Well, it was like the weird 80s. choice, though. Yeah, it just seems like a weird choice if your skin was metal <laughs> or silver to have, like, orange tufts of hair. Oh, yeah, I guess his skin is, like, not actually metal, but it's, it, but it is, like, shiny silver. People always assume he's an actor with, like, some kind of makeup on. Yeah. I mean, it's the future. I'm sure you see weird people dressed up in weird things all the time. Yeah. I feel like he's you know, really good at reading people because that's what he's designed to do and is always kind of like guiding people in really indirect ways because of that. Mainly Jane, like trying to get her to do things, but not by telling her, but by like encouraging her to do things or whatever. He's got like perfect memory and he can play songs, any song he's heard, but he can also improvise and make up new songs, which is a big deal. Mm-hmm. And uh, he Which can... actually isn't that hard. They, they, there are like programs and robots and stuff that can improvise music pretty easily because music is pretty rules based. Oh, wow. Lyrics too? Not lyrics. Okay. <laughs> lyrics is harder. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Cause she like really fixated on that about being upset that he made her name into a beautiful little poem song and she's like, you're just generating them automatically in your I, brain. I wonder how hard it would be though. Like to like run a rhyming dictionary in there and then have it make sense because there are there's like all those predictive robots they tried that they tried it uh this was like something i read a couple years ago now but they tried it and the robot was just like i don't know it was struggling it's just like here's some phrases and it was kind of like they felt like songs kind of but maybe they were just i don't know it felt like predictive text (laughs) um he can run at like 80 miles an hour Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, while carrying That's her. the goof. Like, why did they put that in there? <laughs> when they were designing this musician rope? It was like, also, he's got to be able to run 80 miles an hour. I think that's, like, maybe part of, like, the the gold. Okay, this bothered me. There's the copper robots, the silver robots, and the golder robots. And I was like, why'd you call them that? But the golder ones are, like, bodyguards. So maybe it's just, like, there's, like, a passive function also in these to, like, help you get the fuck out of somewhere. All the names were acronyms, and the ER They're all was like dumb acronyms. It was like electronic robot or something. So they all had to so Golder. Yeah, it just <laughs> sounds like. But yeah, now that we've talked about what he's like. <laughs> okay, so after he's recalled, Jane kind of I don't know gets super paranoid about everything. Yeah, and then she she then runs into some people she knows, Jason and Medea. And they're, like, stalking her around the city, and she's, like, always trying to lose them, but they keep turning up and following her. And she's, like, sure, they're trying to find her to, like, turn her in or something, or, like, uh, because returning the robot also means you get paid back, and so he's worth a lot of money right now. Yeah, and they're, like, talking to her and kind of antagonizing her, like, hey, why don't you want to hang out, Jane? Where are you going? And she's determined to not go back to the apartment. And they keep having this back and forth and she's running all over the slums and they're eventually, she's like, well, I'm not going home. I'm uh, going to see Egyptia. And they're like, what? <laughs> like, and they kind of fill in the blanks for her. It's like, you're going to go see her in that play, aren't you? That terrible play. She just keeps talking about why isn't, why isn't Jane here? Where's Jane? <laughs> uh, yeah, just so happens to be the day of the big play, so she heads back to see Egyptia and Clovis and everybody. Well, there's this whole thing where Clovis is, like, kind of keeps alluding to there being a plan. It's, like, without it ever being said explicitly, it seems like Clovis and Jane have an understanding of Silver is in danger, and Clovis is going to try to help her, but Jason and Medea are constantly in the picture. Yeah, Clovis just ends up orchestrating this crazy plan to, like, get them out of there, but Jane's, like, second-guessing whether or not she trusts him. Yeah, she's not sure she can trust him because he already took Silver away once. But yeah, she's supposed to meet him somewhere and his new boyfriend is going to come pick them up on like, it's like what, basically private jet helicopter thing. But before their plan can take place, there's a giant earthquake that uh, messes up the whole city environment, brings the house down literally at the play, at Gypsy's <laughs> play, and <laughs> propels her to to be famous. But... Anyway, they they go out to this deserted place outside of town where this jet's supposed to pick them up, but then the electric metals people are there, and they take Silver and tell Jane very frankly that they're just going to pull him apart and he won't exist anymore. And there's nothing Jane can do about it, nothing Silver can really do about it. 
and Jane tries to kill herself with a shard of glass in her Uber. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. She wakes up at Clovis's apartment and pretty much the whole time thinks, like, Clovis betrayed her and she's, like, kind of being cruel to him and doing a lot of things that really depressed people do. I felt like Tanith Lee did a really great job of illustrating what it's like to have, like, zero hope. <laughs> yeah, I felt pretty sad at this part. Oh, yeah, I think it, yeah. I was like, <laughs> wow, this is pretty rough. <laughs> but she's just doing the depressed things, like, you know, doesn't care, doesn't want to eat, is, like, walking around Clovis' apartment naked sometimes because she's like, don't care, and being mean to him and wants to die, but won't do it again because that requires caring yeah pretty dark it wasn't actually clovis that betrayed her and the reason that she's still alive is because clovis's boyfriend did find her just a little bit too late Mm. because of the earthquake he got slowed down and and it turns out it wasn't jason and medea either supposedly clovis says they didn't actually want to send silver back or ruin her life they just wanted to torment her about it for as long as they could. Which sounds in line with how everyone kind of behaves that's super rich in this book. Uh huh. <laughs> but I guess what they. Well, I mean, doesn't the tracking device help them? Yeah. Yeah. It was there. They did have a tracking device on her, but it was Egyptia who remembered suddenly oh, yeah, I had this robot. Wanted to get rid of these robots because she realized now that she's an actress, that they're actually a threat to her. I guess I'm unclear on when Egyptia is present or not, and when she's, <laughs> like, because, like, Clovis, I think I believe Clovis saying, like, she answered the phone when Electronic Metals calls, like, what? What robot? Also, I'm gonna eat some avocados now, or, like, whatever, <laughs> and they're like, um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or whatever the future version of the avocados are. I think that that's why Jane, like, doesn't even really hold it against her, because Egyptia's just, like, so loopy, or, like... Yeah. I'm not quite sure what she's thinking. She doesn't understand what she did. Yeah. Yeah. Probably never would. Like, no. there's probably no amount of explaining that Jane could do. <laughs> or she would just forget immediately. Yeah. yeah. Um, Jane finds that out. The seance? Yeah. So there are seances earlier that Clovis does in his apartment with a rig table, and he designed it. It'll spell out basically, like, get out to whoever Clovis's current lover is, and it's designed to, like, spook them into not coming back. <laughs> so they're about to do another one of these, Clovis's, and yeah, they're doing it. And this time it doesn't spell out, like, get out, Leo, whoever Clovis's current boyfriend is. Um, instead, it starts, like, talking to Jane. Yeah, it's pretty silly, though, because it has to spell out each word, but <laughs> Tana Lee doesn't do it. It's just she and this Silver something have a long conversation, but Silver had to spell out every single letter of every word. <laughs> well, that the boyfriend was pretty good at, <laughs> like, translating, because he was, like, looking at it real intensely and then would just say the words. But so. also imagine it was, like, text speech where instead of Y-O-U, it was, like, you. <laughs> yeah. Like... <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, Jane thinks that it's obviously Clovis pulling a prank because you read her manuscript or her journal or whatever. Yeah, but... basically her diary. But then... Well, the Ouija board sings a song that they like silver and jane sang but that was never written in the manuscript so it would be impossible for clovis yes yeah because she doesn't believe it first because clovis is like i'm not doing this this is scary (laughs) and she's like you saw the songs in my book and he's like i'm not reading your book (laughs) (laughs) but it's really silver because he had a soul so this is that what it is is silver had a soul and they the seance connects with the afterworld yeah Okay. It's just the seance works for reals, and he's there. He's, he didn't become, like, oh my gosh. robo <laughs> I thought, ghost. like... He well, thought he was in the seance table now, because that's uh, what I thought initially. Yeah, I thought he was, like, in, like, some sort of implant she had or something, because oh. he says, like, oh, I'm with you forever yeah, now. So. Man. You <laughs> know, the spiritual guy. I was wondering... I was wondering that also, and there is a sequel to this, isn't there? I was wondering there what's is. in the sequel. It's called Metallic Love. Well, we should definitely check that out. Ugh. But <laughs> I'm down. I just why? 
I don't know. Why? I guess I want to know if the sequel takes place in the afterlife or what. Oh yeah, Jane dies and then it's like fantasy. Yeah, it's just a, a robot. <laughs> um. After the seance, Clovis realizes he can just say that he wants to break up instead of doing horrible pranks to his boyfriends. Yeah. And Jane decides to keep living her life and go out and hang out with the other musicians that she met while being a street musician and living her life to the fullest like silver requested through the seance table like do all the things you would have done with me so we can like talk about them when you die but don't die right now <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's how it ends um during this i tried to find something that would automatically generate lyrics and i found deep beat and it'll rhyme, and I can select a genre or like wow. keywords. There's love, truth, and birthday. <laughs> 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 All right, I'm gonna generate some lyrics. All right. All right. Vampires in the club, sipping that true blood, and making sweet love to every woman that you lust. This is about birthdays? What? <laughs> it's my birthday. I deserve to be greedy, huh? <laughs> my music be all in the club, and my faux 15s be sub. And my glass is still on, it's the incredible dork. You may not always find that person in the physical form. It smelled like he took a shit in his little drawers. We ate a different form, a different centrifugal force. Wow. So. <laughs> we're, we're a bit far from silver. Maybe someday. Um, I had an additional thought. Okay. And I don't know if I'm going to blow your guys' minds or not. Yeah. Okay. You mentioned it a couple, like last week, yeah. <laughs> Do you think any of this is real? Or if it's all in Jane's head? Mm. Are you daydreaming this somewhere? <laughs> because there's some... Uh, it shows very early on that she... Hey, Ash. You gonna come in? <laughs> all right. Okay, quiet down. Um, it establishes pretty early on in the book that she's an unreliable narrator. Um, she sort of skips over details and puts forward her opinion of things but there's a part at the party where okay Ash. there's a part at the party where he's singing green sleeves and jane says that he looked right at her but then later when he when she tells silver about that he says no i didn't look at you and i didn't know you were at the party and there's a few other like little moments in the book where she's contradicted on little things that she says <clears throat> and then um and just other things like how she thinks she can tell the difference between the silver models and the sort of evidence that he's human all seems very much like in her head i agree with that like she kind of makes it seem like he's more human than he is yeah even, like you know giving him an orgasm which in the earlier, he says very clearly that he can fake for other people's benefit. Though he, I feel like he does say something later to confirm, like, whoa, that's not supposed to happen. Yeah. And there's, there's like, other times where he sort of acts differently to show that he's human, but they could still be her interpretations of them or, like, changing it because she's not so mentally stable. And their whole magical house is all very <laughs> surreal. Um and then there's the news could have been the truth where like, oh, they aren't actually very human and they are dangerous. So we need to take them back. I mean, obviously no one believes like you're not supposed to believe the news, but it could be. And then the the most damning is that Ouija board like completely <laughs> doesn't make any sense, even in the context of the book. And I picture, you know, her just pushing it to oh all the things gosh. and Clovis is scared of her. Because she's acting crazy. Isn't there a part where none of them are touching it anymore? Yeah. I I just think because she's writing it, she yeah. could say no one was touching it. Yeah. So there's just a lot of... There's a lot of little stuff in there that could make this... It was just a regular robot that she had sex with. And that she sort of put her own uh, thing on. I don't know. Yeah. Play with the idea a little <laughs> bit. Don't just poo-poo it immediately. Uh, I was wondering if that's what you're going to say, because you alluded to it last weekend. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I don't, to... I don't know if Tanith Lee knows that she did this. Yeah. 
we should write her. Here's the third book. She died. Oh, dang. A couple of years ago. Oh, dang. Sorry. <laughs> we can call her on the Ouija board. We can talk about the other call people on the, the Kickstarter Ouija. comments. What? The Kickstarter. The Kickstarter. We should yeah, oh, try yeah. to get that together. Go contact those people who are hardcore fans. We should just read the sequel. See where it goes. I just checked on it. It's kind of a sequel. Oh. But it's not about Jane. Uh. Um, so who do you think this book is for? <laughs> I don't know. Well, I think this book is for me. Because <laughs> I kind of loved this book. Okay. Really? I was embarrassed to say this too, but I think this book is for me. <laughs> I enjoyed it too. Even though it was like, in some parts were kind of grueling. This book is definitely the best that we've read on this show. This is like one of my new favorite books. <laughs> Whoa, okay. You like it a lot more than Whoa. I do. Why do you like it so much, Mimi? I don't know. It's just like... The world building was great, felt like an actual world that was a little bit too close to our world, but I don't know. Is it because all the ones you've read before were so bad? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So this is a book I would read, uh, more so even than The Not World, which just had some things in it that I like. This is a book that is just a regular book. (laughs) But it's also, we saw it's a much more popular book. It is just a regular book as opposed to, you know, garbage sci-fi. And I think it's a few steps above what we've read previously. Because I was wondering about that while I was reading it. Like, I know we discussed that it's like actually a well-rated book. But when I was reading it, it's like, oh no, am I just a garbage book person? (laughs) Like, this is all right. (laughs) Well, Mimi and I are garbage book people. Okay. (laughs) Great. (laughs) So it's a bunch of dumpster goblins. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I guess I also just like robot love stories. It's kind of something I like. I think you guys are both fairly passionate about <laughs> that topic. <laughs> that kind of thing. <laughs> Maybe I liked that she learned to be like a better person or something, but not just like more responsible, like a more fun person. It- and like a nicer person or like I don't know. She did change a lot throughout yeah. the book and I don't know. Who did you think this book was for, Sean? Gosh, I you can Yeah. <laughs> I didn't I didn't think of a good answer because it seemed so uh like not for a specific person. It has all the sci fi stuff, but it has a lot of romance stuff. I think it may be a good young adult novel. Uh, Because there's a lot of those young adult novels like, um, what's the... Well, like The Hunger Games? Yeah, The Hunger Games and stuff where it's kind of a wacky sci-fi world, but then it's really about a young girl finding herself or a young girl's first love. And this is not as cheesy and uh, pandering as I imagine those books to be, but it's still, I think it does those things. Mm -hmm. So I guess... I would put this with other books like that. Yeah, it's a coming-of-age story. Uh, well, I guess that's it, unless anybody has say, anything I else to say. that's it. Do you guys have to talk about your next book? Yeah. Uh, if you would like to join us in March, we are reading The Cosmozoids by Robert Trowens. Mm-hmm.